Dear sisters and brothers, welcome to this first of a four-part series on the seven words of Jesus. It is a known fact that the dying words of a person are always uttered in a very serious manner. Nobody jokes, nobody says something very really light or simple at such a time. Jesus was no different. And these words are so important. They say that never was there a sermon like the last seven words of Jesus. Sometimes not to some of us misunderstand, seven words are not seven words by itself, but seven utterances of Jesus, seven statements of Jesus. Three of them are to do with others, three of his words. The remaining four are to do with himself. And so we say that the first three words which he spoke, the first one was, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. The second word he spoke to the good thief. This day you will be with me in paradise. The third word he spoke to his mother and to his best friend. He really loved. Mother, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. The remaining four words were to do about himself. The first one was my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? The second one was, I thirst. Now, this was no ordinary thirst. Huh? Somebody who's been crucified or not been fed or dry, anybody, obviously they're going to feel thirsty. This was a different type of thirst. We will see that when we come there. The third one was, it is accomplished. And the fourth word was, last, when he gave up his spirit. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Now these words were given by the author of life, the last sermon of his, from the high pulpit of his cross. Never were there any time words like this uttered, which we hear now. And so let us go straight off into the first word, Father, forgive them. Now, I will be using less of the Bible text because I realize that you, my dear sisters and brothers, are very familiar with all these uh, texts. You will have heard this over and over again. You will have meditated upon them. Here I will try to give you some little more insights which I hope would help you as we prepare for this Holy Week. So first one was, Father, forgive them. But we have to just go a little back. And we have the uh, utterances of two others. One was Seneca, who was a philosopher of that time. I mention Seneca by name because he was a brother-in-law of Pontius Pilate. Try and remember Pontius Pilate, the way we know him, this is something aside, he was not a bungling person as made out to him, he washed his hands and he says, no, 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 it's not that. The very wise person, very shrewd man. Um, anybody who was put as a governor to deal with these Jews had to really be smart, had to be very shrewd how to deal. And there were so many different factions, Herodians, Sadducees, Pharisees, the, um, um, the people from outside would come, the, all these people. And they were very, the, um, the zealots, very fundamentalists and very hot-tempered people. For the least thing, there would have been a riot. So he had to, Pontius Pilate was handling all that and he did a marvelous job about it. So knowing that Seneca, Pontius Pilate, they come from a very pedigreed family. Okay, so uh, that was just something by the way. But Seneca and another Cicero, they mentioned, they would mention this, that it was customary for the one being crucified. It was a common form of execution for the criminals, hardened criminals. That at the time of the crucifixion, they would abuse, they would hurl invectives, they would spit on the people in front of them. And in fact, the bystanders, the, passers by, the bystanders would take it upon themselves to tease, to taunt, to irritate these people all the more. And all the more they were excited and uh, keep on hurling abuses at them. But sometimes their abuses were so much that Cicero mentions that they had to climb from behind, climb the cross. 
and pull out their tongues. Not flying from the front because they will have spat on them also. And pull out their tongues. That was the type of abuses. Now what type of, what did they abuse? What did they say? There were different types of reasons for them. One was they were angry. Anyway, everything is gone. So let me say what I need to say and be damned with it. The second one was, if they were guilty, they would ask for forgiveness. And the third one was, if they were either guilty or just being blamed, they would plead their innocence. Jesus was different. He did not plead his innocence. He did not say anything about himself. All but he said the very thing he was preaching all along. What was that? Forgive seven times, seventy times, seven times seven, seventy times seven. All those things. Okay. We have the parable that Jesus spoke in the Gospel of Matthew, the unforgiving servant, the king who forgave the servant so many talents, and he says, "Okay, go, never mind." Huh? So now that same king is being put to the test, and what does he say, Father? He doesn't shout to this, then shout these verses, these words. But very soft voice, softly from the cross, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He cries to the Father. Second, forgive them. Who them? All those who were responsible for him, crucifying him. Forgive all of humanity. We were all our sin. Who was on the cross along with him? Barabbas. Bar Abbas, son of the father. Abbas, Abba is his father. Bar Abbas, son of the father. We are sons of the father. All of us. Father, forgive them. Including the thieves. Remember, both of them were taunting him. Both, not only uh, Barabbas. Both of them were taunting him initially. We will come to that at a later stage. Father, high priest, chief priest, the Romans, the executioners, the bystanders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, the Zealots, all of them, forgive all of them. In a very soft voice, they do not know what they are doing. They don't know. What do they don't know? That they do not know that they are sentencing the author of life to death. They don't know that. And they preferred Barabbas, a criminal, to Jesus. But this is what they do. Knowing this, Father, forgive them. The same blood that Jesus was shedding was to redeem these same very people. Translated today for us. That same blood was being shed for me and for you, my dear sisters and brothers. We have in the Old Testament, when Cain killed Abel, Yahweh speaks to Cain. And says, the blood of Cain, of Abel, is crying for vengeance. In the new Abel who's been shed, the blood who's been shed of the new Abel, there's no vengeance, but only forgiveness. My sisters and brothers, let us bow our heads and reflect on this. Let us pray that, especially this time, when we have been deprived of our masses, of our services, the high point of our liturgical year, the passion, death, resurrection of Jesus. Let us spend some more time to reflect and not only just have a time of uh, a profound reflection just now, but also to say, Lord, give me the grace that I might be able to change my life, make small amendments for the sake of your glory. Let us prayerfully reflect and pray. God bless you. As I mentioned in the first session, seven words were spoken, three Jesus spoke about himself. Yesterday we did the first word, Father forgive them for they know not what they do. Today we will look in this next uh, segment at the next two words Jesus promised to the good thief, this day you will be with me in paradise. And the second one, Jesus speaking to his mother and to John the Apostle, the Evangelist. Mm -hmm. Son, behold your mother, mother, behold your son. Well, to come to the first one and uh, without any delay, further delay. Hmm? It is a known fact, as he mentioned yesterday, that those who were crucified would revile, they would abuse, they would taunt and all those type of things. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15, verse 32, we have both the thieves, both of them revile Jesus. 
They taunted him. But on hearing him plead to the Father to forgive everyone, there was a change in heart in one of them. We must remember that pain and suffering is, doesn't bring out the best in us. Sometimes it makes us bitter, makes us sad. Sometimes suffering can make us better. Okay? Our souls are bruised, battered. Very rare times that we see the redemptive value of our sufferings. Suffering which is unspiritualized can really make us degenerate in our attitudes. So we have the two criminals. Both of them revile Jesus. But in one wanted to be taken down from the cross, the good thief wanted to be taken up. Here we have a case of one dying man asking another dying man to be saved. He asked him for eternal life. A man at the door of death is asking for paradise. Consider the situation of this good thief. Tradition calls, gives him the name of Dismas. Tradition, Dismas is a name given to him. In that one, I, we don't know whether he has prayed before, but in this one act, he knocked once, he sought once, and he asked once. He dared everything and gained everything. But now we come to a very strange part about this whole thing. In the Gloria we say, He descended into hell and on the third day He rose again. Descended into hell is a very strange way of Jesus fulfilling His promise to the good thief. This day you will be with me in paradise. How are we supposed to understand this? Let's walk through this little point. We know that uh, um, in the Latin, the word for which was not heaven was called inferno, burning, a place of burning, a place of, place of separation, the pain of separation, hell, whatever you want to call it. So in the Latin, the, the Gloria would be, he descended into the inferno. Peter, in his letter, the first Peter, 1 Peter 3 verse 19 says, he went to preach to the souls in prison. Same for this, describing the same place. And in Luke chapter 16, the parable of uh, the, the rich man and Lazarus. When Lazarus, he dies, he goes to Abraham's bosom. So three different words to describe the same place. Abraham's bosom, paradise, descent into hell, souls in prison, all these words. And then the Greek word, is, uh, it's, uh, in Peter, Peter's letter, chapter 4, verse 6, is given there. The good news was preached to those in prison. The Greek word there is heralded. So the good news was heralded. It was brought forth to those in prison. And that is what is meant by Jesus. And he went to announce the good news that now the doors of redemption was achieved. The doors of heaven were opened to all those who were in pain. What pain? Not suffering and burning, not that type of pain, but the pain of being separated. Now that by atonement, at one moment, getting together, that has been achieved. So this day, you will be with me in paradise. We hurry along and go to the next uh, uh, verse, the promise of Jesus. Hmm? Jesus says, woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. Now, we have heard this so often. And uh, sometimes we understand it, uh, maybe Jesus was making uh, some uh, domestic provisions for his mother. And this is some of the enemies of uh, the Catholic Church, their understanding will say, oh no, no, nothing to be read into this, far from it, far from it. So one principle that we have to bear in mind is this, that everything that happened in the Passion, Death and Resurrection, of Jesus was for our salvation. There was not a loose strand or something. It was not necessary. It was done. That was not the case. Everything that was done was important. Everything was for our salvation. And we have to look at this even word of Jesus from the cross. Remember the pulpit of the dying man. There's not going to be any extra words. Everything is meaningful, full of meaning. So here we have this particular situation. You know, 
where Jesus says, Behold your mother, mother, behold your son. It is not that Jesus was making provisions. Jesus was a master planner. You saw how he um, arranged for the Last Supper. All the planning was done. You saw how he, we have seen how he has arranged for the triumphant entry. Go to so and so place, you'll find a man carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him, ask the man, ask him to release the uh, colt. So, all that. You remember how he sent the 70 two by two? Can you plan different 36 different journeys, 36 different routes for um, the people? I will give you one whole week. Let me see you planning. It's a difficult job. He could plan. So, to think that Jesus forgot to look after his mother, this is far from, doesn't uh, add up. So what is, how are we supposed to understand this? Remember also another point to bear in mind, at the foot of the cross, we read this from uh, Matthew's Gospel, also John's mother was standing there. So what did she feel when suddenly Jesus says, you know, mother, behold your son, son, behold your mother. I mean, what happens to her? Is she thrown out of the equation? Not at all. Not at all. But we are supposed to understand, this is a son. Behold, you are a disciple. This is your mother. How do we get this understanding? Fast forward to the book of Revelations. In chapter 12, you have that cosmic battle between the dragon and the woman who is uh, understood as Mary or the church. And so the dragon goes to war and make war on the woman. And read that. It's nice, the last part of the chapter, where then finally, finally it is, because the dragon then is furious and goes to wage war on the offspring of her, on her children. Who are her children? Those who bear testimony to her son, Jesus. Those who bear testimony to her son, Jesus. So if you say that you're a disciple of Jesus, then Mary is automatically your mother. Today in our modern generation, we have several families, several of us have experienced that, where the children on growing up refuse to acknowledge their parents. Whether they acknowledge or don't acknowledge, the fact still remains that the mother is the mother and the father is the father. So whether our separated brethren, they like to be called as enlightened brothers, what do they like to describe themselves as? The truth is, they may or may not accept Mary, but Mary is their mother. She still prays for them and we also need to pray for our brothers. But just now the point is, John took her to be in the house, with, stay, live with him. And when he took her, was a living person who he could converse with. And I'm sure Mary has brought in a lot of uh, uh, conversation and understanding to John in his uh, understanding the role of the Messiah and everything about his life from uh, directly from Mary. Unlike us, when we say we have a devotion to Mary, what do we have in a house? One statue and two dogmas. But John had a living lady in his house and he's privileged to have Mary, the mother of God, looking after him and he looking after her. Thank you for this. We'll continue in the next segment. The first two segments, we saw the first three words of Jesus from the cross where he says, uh, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Then he says, this day he tells a good thief, this day you will be with me in paradise. And the third verse, as we've seen, to his mother and to uh, the Apostle John. In the first one, Jesus exercises his uh, pleading for sinners in general. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. In the second word that he speaks from the cross, he is adapted his there assume his role anticipated rather his role as the future judge separating the sheep from the goats which we see in uh, Matthew chapter 25 and and the third was uh, third word I'm sorry third word which he speaks from the cross to his mother and to uh, John the uh, uh, apostle he gives uh, the disciple a new spiritual mother for all of redeemed humanity, not only for them, but all of us, the redeemed humanity. Okay, now we go to the next uh, set of four uh, words. We shall take two of them in this segment. Okay, the first one is from Matthew chapter 27, verse uh, 46, where Jesus says, cries out in, in abandonment to the Father, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, we know that in the, in the noon, 
the entire sky grew darkened grew very dark and we see something of uh, uh, difference now if you remember in Bethlehem the night was turned into day when the choirs of angels came out and singing hosannas here in this case the opposite is happening the day is turning into darkness into night this was the rule of Satan and Jesus one uh, of the commentators speaks about this he says the face of Jesus was so contorted taking upon the sin of the world sinful humanity that creation could not bear to look on the face of their own creator and so they shut off the light it's a beautiful thought to think of a creation could not bear to see the face of their redeemer at the face of the creator and so they shut off their lights so we have that in this case we have you know the light of the world being crucified and therefore the cosmic symbols of this very light the sun grows dark okay so we have this um, uh, father of uh, sorry uh, my god my god now for the bystanders there they heard this clearly my god my god and if you uh, refer to the gospel text you will see immediately somebody uh, uh, someone else said wait wait let's see whether elijah comes why do they say this because to the jews they were familiar with all these psalms the beginning of the psalms is this my god my god but at the end of it towards verse 21 he says that wait he will finally send the helper he will send in fact um, uh, i just want to refer to that text here itself hmm? but you o lord be not far off oh my help hasten to my aid deliver and so we have then in verse um, um, uh, uh, verse 24 for he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted and he has not hidden his face from him but has heard when he cried to him so we see that uh, uh, there is help which is there and they waited to see that maybe now there will be some help but the heavens were silent and so uh, we see that Jesus you know he went through this tremendous pain okay and uh, the the one person who taught us how to pray with our father you know your kingdom come your will be done now he cries out and says why have you forsaken me what was that type of pain we all are familiar with the physical pain that he went through and need no need to go into that again but there was accompanied with that was another deeper pain which is the mental anguish which he cried in Gethsemane you remember the gospel say that he sweated drops of blood okay and there that whole burden of what he was going to was there make very real when he, to him and that's when he said father if it is possible take this cup away but not my will your will be done and so we have upon him the withdrawal he withdraws from all divine does not want being god he can make use of divine consolation he can perform many miracles he says no jesus never performed a miracle for himself he always prepared perform miracles for the benefit of others to liberate as he announced you know at the start of um, the gospel I have come to set the captives free to set the prisoners free to bring healing and so on and so forth and then we have the third type the deepest form of pain which is the spiritual pain and here we see in spiritual pain what he experiences abandonment total rejection rejection separation from God don't you think today because so many people are lonely this is one of the causes of suicide nobody to talk to no and so this is what Jesus felt totally rejected by humanity abandoned by God because whole sky grew dark in a certain sense and he hung on the cross between heaven and earth helpless and that's when he says my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in this moment, through this passion, death and resurrection of Jesus, we see that the breach which was there between heaven and human beings, between us, has been breached. So he was there to breach that gap. So here he was a mediator for sinful humanity. We go to the next verse, which is the briefest of them. And Jesus says, I thirst. This is from uh, the Gospel of John, verse, chapter 19, verse 28. 
When Jesus said, I thirst, was he speaking about himself? Maybe. The person who was so tired, exhausted, beaten, in pain, perhaps had a fever with the amount of pain, loss of electrolytes, loss of fluids, body fluids, loss of blood, is bound to feel thirsty. But if you also recall, the gospel text say, when he was offered wine and myrrh, he refused. Why was myrrh put? Myrrh was added there as an agent to deaden the pain, like an analgesic to deaden the pain. That he refused. But later on, so that the scriptures may be fulfilled, he says, I thirst. And that time, if you see a lot of Old Testament imagery, imagery, a lot of uh, prophecies being fulfilled. The Lamb of God slain for us. Okay, the Passover feast at the same time going on. Okay, and at the same time you have uh, the wine, the sour wine. It's called sour wine. It's the cheap wine of the soldiers put on a hyssop. Hyssop, you remember that? That was the hyssop on which the blood of the lamb or the Passover lamb was taken and sprinkled on the doorposts and the lentils of the homes. So same thing, hyssop, wine given to him, that he drinks. And remember, come to think of it, this is the same Jesus who told the Samaritan woman, the water that I give you, you'll never make you thirst again. So he had all these possibilities where he could satisfy himself. But here, scripture had to be fulfilled. And we have in Psalm 69, verse 20 and 21. I'll read 21 to you. They gave me gall for food and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. And so that the scriptures may be fulfilled, this is how Jesus accepted the wine. And with this, we come to the end of this little segment. Spend some time in quiet prayer reflecting on these two words of Jesus. The utter desolation and even the physical thirst, the physical anguish of the body. Amen. Welcome. We come to the last segment in this seven words from the cross. Here we shall take the last two words spoken by Jesus from the cross. The first one is, it is accomplished. And the second one is, uh, what Jesus speaks from the last word which he says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. We take the first one, it is accomplished. This one sentence, one word, occurs at the beginning of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, at the end of the Bible, in the last book, in the book of Revelations. And suspended between the book of Genesis and the book of Revelation is this particular time when Jesus utters this word. So three times God has uttered this word. In Genesis we have in chapter uh, 2 itself, after the all of creation was, uh, uh, after was completed, then the heavens, I'm reading from Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Then the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day. We have this in the book of Genesis, that God, after creating all of the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, man, everything. Then finally he said, it is finished, the work is over. That beautiful work, the handmaid of his creation, the whole thing. We see that the harmony, the beauty, the nature, the birds, the fish, the mountains, all of it in harmony. We don't have the environmental problems we face today in our day and time because of man interfering with nature. But there you have the beauty of nature. And in all that pristine glory, you also have the serpent, Satan coming in and rupturing and spoiling that whole thing. Right from the start, he sets his little trick, bag of tricks. And then we see this whole breach that takes place between God and man. Everything was given to us. That work was shattered. Then we also have in the book of Revelations, chapter 21. In 21.5, Jesus said, God says, Behold, I make all things new. 
And after, uh, if you go to Book of Revelations, and after that, we, we also find, write this verse, it is done, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Immediately after that, he says, it is done, I am the Alpha and the Omega. And so you have the new heaven, the new earth, everything is, and in between this, we have Jesus saying this word. What is what was accomplished? It is finished. It is accomplished. What was finished? What was accomplished? Hmm? The joining of God along with the people, His creation once again. That breach, that rupture was finally done. But there is also another aspect. The cruci crucifixion of Jesus cannot be seen in isolation. It's the Easter Triduum which starts on Monday, Thursday, Good Friday and Easter Sunday. So, it's not only the passion. The church will always speak of the passion, death, resurrection of Jesus. This is one whole movement and we always look at it in that particular way. Okay. So, we have in the Garden of Eden, hmm, the three elements which were there for the destruction of our relationship with God. Those same three tools are used now. Instead of disobedient Adam, we have now the obedient new Adam, which is Jesus Christ. Instead of the um, uh, proud Eve in the book of Genesis, now you have the new Eve, humble. And instead of the tree in the middle of the garden, you have the new tree of our salvation, which is the tree of the cross. We also say when you say it is finished, the Passover meal started on Monday, Thursday. There are the rabbis, they identified four cups of blessings which were there. Three are over there and the fourth one, they yet have to drink that last cup. After all is done, after everything is completed, now this is the end of the Passover. There's a lot of symbolism. The time doesn't permit me to go into all those details. But it's important to remember that here we are having that fourth cup the end of that Passover meal, now it is finished, it is accomplished. The sacrifice that Jesus came to do has been totally completed. Remember one thing in the Gospel of John chapter 10 verse 18, it's given, Jesus says, nobody takes my life from me, nobody can take my life from me. I lay it down, I lay it down. So nobody could take his life, his life would go only when he decided that he needed to go. That is very clear. And so here we have Jesus after taking, drinking of that fourth cup. And this uh, point has been very nicely, persuasively been explained by uh, the uh, by Scott Hunt. If you heard of him, the Presbyterian um, uh, uh, biblical scholar who's converted and become a Catholic today. He explains that so beautifully in his uh, uh, talks, the fourth cup which was drunk. And so Jesus, after completing everything, now says, it is finished. It is accomplished. And this is the phrase that comes between the book of Genesis and the book of Revelation. And after saying this, we have uh, in the next word, the last word which Jesus says, he says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And this is, he puts his head down and dies. There was a quiz once we said, you know, on Good Friday, who died? Did Jesus as a man, did he die? Or Jesus as, um, in his humanity, he died, not in his divinity? Or Jesus here, and Jesus there? The truth is that Jesus is God. God died. The point, the question people ask is, if God died, then how was the world running? Now, <laughs> That's not the scope of this uh, here. But if you try and understand, when you say death, what does death mean? That means separation of body from spirit. Huh? So we sing that song, no? when we die, we are sure that we are not dead, we are not annihilated, but we exist in a different way. Hmm? So our spirits still continue. For Jesus, the body and spirit were separated, but he still continued, isn't it? We also, our bodies and spirit, but then on the third day, his body and spirit came together. 
in the new resurrected way. What that way means, Paul and all has spoken, uh, the apostles have spoken splendidly on that. But still, we, are, we will not know what, what does food mean to a resurrected body because Jesus ate fish. But that's another, another scope of something else. We see in the sixth word where Jesus says, um, uh, it is accomplished. In this, in this particular word, okay, it is a, Jesus give, bids farewell to the earthly journey, to the time factor that he, the time that he was in, and then now he says, "Into your hands I commend my spirit." Spirit, Jesus is looking upwards to the glory he will take up now in his resurrected body. Okay? So these words were not spoken in a whisper, but they were taken said very clearly and translated very clearly. One final point before I close is all this happened around 3 o'clock when Jesus gave up his spirit and immediately after that the soldiers come because it's time to take down the bodies. The bodies could not be hung, kept hanging for overnight and next day was the Sabbath and so on. So they come and they pierce his side because they, he was so obviously dead. The other two soldiers, other two thieves, they robbers, they broke their legs and uh, that was. But in Jesus' case, he was already dead and fulfilled scripture by saying, Not a bone is broken, okay? They look upon him who is pierced. There's one more symbolism in all this. That day also was a Passover. That day, thousands of lambs were slain in the temple. And in the temple, there was this altar where the uh, sacrifice and the blood was poured on the altar, and there was a conduit. From there, they emptied out into the Kidron Valley. Pouring blood at various times, some of the blood will get congealed and it will get choked. But around 3 o'clock, then the sacrifice would stop around that time. And at that time, they would pour water into that to clean up that drain. And finally, they had to really ram it down with some, uh, uh, push it down with a vacuum pump type of thing and push out all the water and blood. And in the Kidron Valley, in the drainage area there, finally when that only instead of blood, only blood and water flowed out, it signified an end of the sacrifice, end of the day. Here again, a very important symbolism here, blood and water flowed out. It means, one, one says scientifically, yes, Jesus was dead. On the other side, it also shows that the uh, end of the sacrifice, the Lamb of God, Who's taken a, who take, takes away the sin of the world. That entire sacrifice was accomplished. Once and for all, no more lambs to be sacrificed. Permanently, Jesus is there in the book of Revelation. It says, the lamb that was slain before the father, the lamb that was slain in Revelation chapter 13 will be given. We'll see that there. So, my dear brothers and sisters, at this time, let us use these last few days to really reflect. And maybe after... Uh, after Easter also reflect on these words so that we will be able to encourage our own selves to live a better life in the light of the Lord. God bless you. Amen.